We are champions of care. Health insurance providers working together as one. Making health care better and coverage more affordable for every American. Listening and guiding the conversation on care. We are advancing mental and physical health. Always improving how and where we help others. Harnessing the power of our collective expertise. Turning healthy insights into helpful innovations. All for the greater good. So everyone can thrive in good health together. That's what care does. Hi, good morning. I'm David Merritt, Executive Vice President of Public Affairs and Strategic Initiatives here at AHIP. Welcome to our annual State of the Industry event. We're really excited to host you today. We're going to have a great discussion about the policies and trends that health insurance providers are watching in 2022, as well as the solutions we see to the challenges we face. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by a number of AHIP colleagues. These are genuine industry leaders and policy experts and we'll cover the leading issues that are driving the industry both here in Washington as well as in the states. Uh, everything from surprise bills and of course COVID-19 to Medicare Advantage and mental health. Uh, first, we're gonna hear from my colleague, uh, Matt Isles, AHIP President and CEO. He has more than 20 years of experience in the private sector and in government and has led teams at Fortune 200 healthcare companies in diverse roles, everything from public policy government affairs, advocacy to corporate communications, both here in the US and abroad. Uh, Matt led policy at AHIP before being named president and CEO in 2018. He sits on both the board of directors as well as the executive committee of the National Health Council. And for the past four years, he's been named one of the most, one, one of the most influential people in healthcare by modern healthcare. After Matt's remarks, we'll be joined by a panel of AHIP experts to explore in detail our solutions to make affordable, high quality healthcare available to every American. And we'll save plenty of time for your questions in a moderated Q&A session. You can submit your questions to the moderator through that chat function. So let's just jump right in. And I'm very pleased to turn things over to Matt Isles. Morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, David, for that very flattering uh, setup. And thank you all for attending the state of uh, the industry event today. Uh, so guiding greater health. You know, it's really as simple as, as motivating and as multifaceted, you know, as that. We know right now that Americans are more focused than ever on health. They're prioritizing both their physical, uh, mental health well-being. Uh, they're fighting to emerge from a global pandemic. And greater health isn't just a policy issue here in D.C. Um, it's an essential national priority as Americans continue to lead on the global stage. Uh, healthier people uh, lead to a happier, less stressed nation. And we all know we're feeling the stresses these days. Um, and we're hoping that with better health, we can all come together as a nation as well. Good health improves everything from relationships, quality of life, uh, the ability to build a successful business. It enables people to thrive physically, emotionally, socially, financially. And that translates directly to a stronger America, both locally and around the country. Um, with those goals, those values that inspire America's health insurance providers, we're here today to share uh, some really important information about how we see the future unfolding. We know we're about guiding and supporting consumers through their healthcare journey, uh, advancing mental and physical health. Uh, that's more important now than ever collaborating with our provider partners to deliver high value, high quality care, and turning healthy insights into helpful innovation. And that's why for 2022, uh, our focus, our vision for this year and beyond is leading solutions and advocating for policies that will result in healthier people, healthier families, healthier communities, and really a healthier nation. Our commitment to action for 2021, it's really more than just a vision. Over the last year, we've been fighting every day for the people that we serve with a focus on ensuring that they get affordable, high quality and equitable healthcare. It's what they need, it's what they deserve. And we believe that no one should ever face a surprise medical bill. 
that can lead to financial ruin. That's why we've worked so hard to protect Americans from crippling surprise medical bills. We've backed the Biden administration's efforts to this end. Um, we know that this practice has harmed and bankrupted too many hardworking American families. Uh, we also supported uh, passage of the No Surprises Act to protect patients from receiving a bill for care that they couldn't choose um, or from a doctor they might not even know had treated them. Uh, the No Surprises Act, it's really a crucial step in relegating surprise billing to the past. But even now, we know there are entities out there, private, sec private equity-backed physicians and other organizations that are fighting to reverse those protections now in court. And with the law under attack, uh, with multiple lawsuits, and I know we'll get into this uh, a little bit more, AHIP continues to fight and protect the law, filing friend of the court briefs to make clear that patients deserve these protections. They deserve access to affordable care, and they deserve access to competitive healthcare markets. We've also been advocating for solutions to expand coverage. Um, our members are all about expanding coverage to more Americans. Uh, we want every American to have the financial stability and peace of mind that health insurance offers. Um, and as we know, everyone's trying to overcome the effects of the pandemic. We at AHIP have supported many solutions to ensure that all Americans can have access to affordable health insurance. Let me just list maybe a couple of these efforts, uh, including uh, continuing the improved subsidies uh, that were part of the American Rescue Plan Act or ARPA. Uh, which are helping people today uh, buy coverage in the individual market. Um, expanding enrollment flexibilities for low-income people and families. Uh, continuing support for employer-sponsored insurance, including the renewal of authority to provide first-dollar coverage for telehealth in high-deductible health plans. We've seen remarkable results. A record 14.5 million people now have coverage through the individual market, a record 81 million people are covered and participating in Medicaid. Uh, nearly 29 million are participating in Medicare Advantage plans. Um, and employer-provided coverage has also shown extraordinarily uh, strong resilience through COVID-19 with affordable access to care, effective ways to improve health, and financial security for almost 180 million Americans. And the coverage that people have continues to improve. Medicare Advantage plans, for example, have flexibilities to provide members with even more impactful benefits from transportation and meal delivery benefits to companion care. Telehealth coverage. We know how important telehealth and virtual care has been dramatically expanding uh, through COVID. And patients now can get the care they need when they need it, including mental health support. In Medicaid, we're seeing new programs and community partnerships that are providing healthy meals, exercise programs, improving individual health, and reducing social barriers to health as well. We know that everyone deserves healthcare access regardless of the individual qualities that make each of us who we are, from our race and zip code to gender, age, and how much we earn. And we're working together to improve our outreach to underserved communities and to combat social factors that can lead to poor health conditions. At AHIP here, we've expanded initiatives to provide health and financial education to underserved communities. Through the pandemic, health insurance providers have also put their community relationships and partnerships to use with new efforts that build on our longstanding commitment to improve health equity, which is critically important. Uh, last year, our Vaccine Community Connectors Program just as one example, help connect uh, more than 2 million seniors from at-risk communities against COVID-19 in less than 100 days. Um, our member companies have brought culturally ap appropriate care to communities too. Uh, just a couple of examples here. Oscar Health's Culturally Competent Care Grant Program tailors healthcare services to meet patients' social and cultural and linguistic needs. Um, or Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas's uh, program, which is partnering uh, with the healthcare advocacy organization to support local agencies across the state focused on reducing social and health inequities, especially in communities of color affected by COVID-19. 
or LA Care on the West Coast, which has launched a new health equity department with a focus on equity issues involving employees, members, and vendors. We're doing our part to improve health equity, and we're not going to waver from this commitment. We've also stood with seniors and people with disabilities against any cuts to Medicare Advantage coverage that they so highly value. Over 28 million Americans have chosen Medicare Advantage because we know it delivers better services, better access to care, and better value. And health insurance providers helped ensure that Americans wouldn't see any cuts to their benefits. MA plans continue to expand the important services they offer, delivering more value to the seniors and Americans with disabilities that rely on the program every day, from dental and vision and hearing benefits to meal and transportation benefits to wellness programs. And because their constituents so highly value MA, MA has strong bipartisan support in both sides of Congress. It's pretty remarkable. Over 340 bipartisan House members recently signed on to a letter to CMS urging the agency to keep MA strong and stable. And just last week, the Senate followed suit with over 60 bipartisan senators joining the fight for MA. Let's look ahead to some commitments in 2022 that we know are going to be so important. And our commitments remain strong, uh, especially with a focus on policies and solutions that improve affordable access to care. Let me talk about just a few of the priorities that we have in mind. First, ensuring that more Americans have access to affordable coverage and care. Uh, this is critically important for both their physical and their mental well-being. We need to address, though, the underlying cost drivers of care. This is uh, uh, an enormous burden that we face. Second, ending pharma monopolies and patent gaming that gives free license to set and raise prices, uh, shut out generic and biosimilar competitors, and undermine tools for negotiating lower prices and savings for patients and consumers. We're going to highlight hospital and physician consolidation, which raises costs and limits patient choice as well. We're going to push back on restrictions on evidence-based medical management, which is a critical tool to support health insurance providers' efforts to prioritize treatments that work, that are high quality, proven, and affordable. Um, we want to make sure that uh, any limits on telehealth or other technologies that give patients more convenient and more affordable ways to see a doctor, therapist, or other clinical experts for the care they need. We wanna make sure that there aren't any limits there. And encouraging the adoption of technology solutions that we know improve efficiency, reduce waste, and move us towards a truly interoperable, consumer-centered healthcare system. A second big focus area is on improving health equity. So everyone has an equal opportunity to thrive and achieve their best possible health. For years, uh, we've supported work to improve health equity, both through direct industry action and also by promoting policy solutions. Um, this year, AHIP will develop a post-pandemic roadmap for achieving even more progress to make the delivery of healthcare more equitable. And we're gonna also continue to work with federal and state agencies to define the framework that's needed to achieve sustainable change. That includes things like data collection standards, defining equitable networks, and establishing new health equity measures for value-based arrangements. Third, we're working together uh, not just to overcome COVID-19, but also to develop a clear vision for the post-pandemic healthcare world. Um, and I know all of us can't wait to get to that point, but there's a lot of work to that remains to be done until we get there. We need to maintain the coverage gains so that those who were protected during the pandemic will be protected after. it. That includes extending the marketplace subsidies that I mentioned earlier that have made uh, health insurance coverage so affordable for so many Americans. Uh, we're also partnering with states to define a pathway for Medicaid redetermination. Uh, and I know we'll get into this a little bit more as well to assure that millions of people suddenly don't lose their coverage when the public health emergency ends. Finally, we're focused on supporting a competitive free market. We know that the competitive market has proven time and again its critical role in innovating, taking decisive actions to respond to the COVID emergency. It's what ensured early access to testing and treatment without cost being a barrier, 
and it's what's helped power effective vaccines in a matter of months. We know competitive markets work. They move swiftly, innovate effectively, and respond to Americans' desires and needs. Private market coverage, whether through the employer-provided market, the individual market, Medicare Advantage, or Medicaid managed care, must be protected and preserved to ensure affordability, choice, and innovation. So let me close with a couple of final thoughts. First, we are champions of care in 2022 and beyond, and our focus is squarely going to be on the health and well-being of Americans. I really can't stress that enough. It is top of mind for us at AHIP here every single day. Our reason for being is to ensure that Americans can live lives to their fullest, to be blessed with access to affordable health care that ensures their financial stability as well. Everything we do is in service to guiding greater health. And we're not going to shrink from the challenges that may face us and that lie ahead because we know how high the stakes are. So now I'd like to turn it over to a panel of AHIP experts and go a little bit deeper uh, into our patient-centric vision. And let me introduce them to you. I'm really uh, proud and excited to have them here with us today. Kate Berry is Senior Vice President of Clinical Affairs and Strategic Partnerships. She works directly with the Chief Medical Officers to understand how they are thinking of the latest clinical issues in research, including COVID-19, mental health care access, women's health, and health equity. Danielle Lloyd is Senior Vice President of Private Market Innovation and Quality Initiatives. She's an expert in areas that include clinical quality measures, value-based care, and AHIP's new privacy priorities for protecting Americans' healthcare data. And finally, Mark Hamelberg is Senior Vice President of Federal Programs. He's an expert in policies that impact Medicare Advantage and Medicaid. Thank you so much for joining me here today. I'm really excited to, to jump in here with a couple of questions. And Kate, maybe we can start uh, just first with you. Um, and I know that we're all looking ahead to the post-pandemic world. Um, maybe you could share a little uh, perspective on what the chief medical officers are thinking about uh, as they look ahead to uh, a post-pandemic uh, world. Well, Matt, thanks so much for the question. And uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of the uh, state of the industry conversation today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, well, you know, we all want to get on um, beyond the pandemic and back to more of a sense of normalcy. Um, in terms of what our chief medical officers are thinking about um, for the post-pandemic world, I'd like to highlight really three things. Um, Starting first with telehealth, and Matt talked about the importance of telehealth um, during the pandemic and going forward. And obviously, there's been a tremendous amount of growth um, in telehealth. I remember um, quite vividly one of our very first Zoom calls with our CMOs um, back before Zoom was our daily, <laughs> daily life. Um, but, you know, the CMOs back in mid-March basically said, we need to open up telehealth as quickly and broadly as possible um, to make sure that people continue to have access uh, to the care that they need. So, um, you know, the efforts of the health insurance providers during that early time uh, really included leveraging the existing contracts they had in place with national um, telehealth platforms as well as working uh, closely with the providers in their network to, to help them deploy telehealth uh, technologies to help them be able to provide ongoing patient uh, care to their, um, their very own patients. So that was an important piece of it. Telehealth isn't new in terms of being available in the benefits, um, uh, but with the flexibilities that were put in place during the public health emergency, it really, um, you know, the use of telehealth truly skyrocketed. Going forward, um, the CMOs are really thinking about how do we integrate telehealth with um, you know, the healthcare system more broadly so that people get the right, um, the right care at the right time in the best setting, whether that's uh, virtual or in person. Um, and actually, you know, the ability to integrate telehealth 
with the overall system is much more likely to happen in value-based payment arrangements, which is the second um, sort of the second theme that I wanted to highlight. Um, so basically, for the providers who were operating in a fee-for-service environment, it was much harder for them to adapt when the world changed and patients were no longer um, coming in the door. So they didn't really have enough revenue to help them kind of move toward, um, you know, fully leveraging telehealth. And, you know, so when a value-based arrangement, um, telehealth can become a part of the regular routine. And the providers are also much more accustomed to reaching out to their patients on an ongoing basis. So the CMOs are continuing to work with providers to implement those value-based arrangements, um, you know, which is a really important way to al align incentives around improving quality outcomes. And third, I'll just um, highlight briefly that the CMOs are really focused on getting people caught up on the preventive services and vaccines that may have lagged during the um, during the pandemic, so you know about 37 million um, uh, vaccines weren't delivered to adults and adolescents um, during the public health emergency. So it's really really important to get people caught up on those recommended vaccines, as well as the. Um, cancer screenings and other preventive services that people need, things like mammograms and colonoscopies. So the way that the plans are trying to increase the use of those recommended preventive services is doing outreach directly to consumers and the, their members to encourage them to catch up, making them aware of, of um, where those services are available and that they're, for the most part, almost all available with no cost sharing. And then they're also um, working with providers to make sure that they're reaching out to their patients as well. So back to you, Matt. <laughs> Thanks for those perspectives, uh, Kate. Now that's uh, a, a really um, interesting and I think important way to think about the you know the future that I know we're all looking forward to. Um, and just a reminder, I know that uh, you can uh, for people who are uh, uh, participating here today, you can uh, post a question. Uh, we can uh, get to some of them too. So just want to remind people that we'll be uh, taking uh, audience questions as well. But um, as we sort of uh, uh, gather those together, maybe Mark, um, why don't you maybe share a little bit about what the end of the pandemic could mean for important shifts uh, for people who qualify for Medicaid, uh, for Medicare. What are the issues and areas that the AHIP team is watching closely for in, in these markets? Sure. Uh, thanks for the question, Matt. And hello, everyone. Uh, well, I'll start by saying that a number of the clinical issues that Kate mentioned sort of cut across programs, but many of them are of particular interest uh, in Medicare and Medicaid. So I guess what I'll highlight are really the implications from some of the COVID relief laws that were enacted and some of the regulatory flexibilities that were provided that are really tied to the public health emergency. When that ends, it could trigger some uh, particularly significant benefit changes in both programs. And as you alluded to, um, it could have some very significant impacts on the numbers of people who are eligible for Medicaid. So let me explain what I mean by all this. Um, <clears throat> so first, in Medicare, um, examples of the sorts of benefits that we're talking about are that during the public health emergency, enrollees pay no cost sharing for their COVID-19 testing and related services. Same goes for things like monoclonal antibody fusions. Uh, and, and those apply both in the original Medicare program and the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, but there also are some specific provisions that are directed at Medicare Advantage and Part D. For example, you have regulations that allow MA enrollees access to out-of-network coverage at in-network cost sharing during the PHE. While it isn't 100% clear under these administrative rules what the exact trigger will be at the end, as a general matter, sometime in or about the end of the PHE, those provisions will will end. 
MA and Part D sponsors have also been given flexibility to waive or reduce premiums and make mid-year benefit enhancements during the PHE. So some of those flexibilities are going to end. And for Medicaid, similarly, you've got a number of important benefit provisions specifically tied to the end of the public health emergency, like a requirement ensuring that all states provide coverage without cost sharing for the uh, for the COVID-19 vaccine, for administration costs, and for testing and treatment, and a number of operational waivers that were given to states in, in running their Medicaid programs, and they'll end at the end of the PHE or some uh, specific period after. And as you and I both alluded to, maybe one of the most significant impacts that will have um, shifts, potential shifts across different uh, programs and products relates to eligibility in Medicaid. Uh, now, as, as a reminder, when the PHE began, one of the earliest pieces of relief legislation gave states an increase in their federal Medicaid matching funds. In return, the states agreed to maintain Medicaid eligibility for their beneficiaries through the end of the public health emergency. So basically what that means is states have not been doing their regular eligibility reviews and disenrolling people when they no longer qualify. So now we've gone through almost two years and incomes and other conditions have changed and some people are no longer going to be eligible. In fact, we now have more than 80 million people in Medicaid and CHIP and there have been estimates that millions could end up losing coverage when this process kicks in. These are just projections at this point. We don't know for sure, but it, it is going to be potentially quite disruptive. For those who do lose coverage, many will likely end up in the individual marketplace and some potentially in other sources of coverage like employers. Now, this is a significant concern for CMS and for us and many stakeholders. Um, both the people who lose coverage and the people who remain eligible, but at least temporarily could run into barriers in this process because of processing delays or other problems, including, for example, states may not have their updated addresses and they actually never contact them and give them the opportunity to go through the reprocessing. So this could result in a number of people losing coverage, not really because they're no longer eligible, but just because the process has, uh, has at least temporarily kick them out of coverage. So that's something that we are tremendously focused on and uh, is going to be one of the big issues once the PHE ends. Yeah, that's going to be a huge issue, Mark. Thanks for flagging that one. Uh, Danielle, maybe we could turn a little bit to the explosion in the use uh, of technologies uh, that we've seen by patients, physicians, especially through the pandemic to address health issues. What are some of the opportunities that are top of mind for you? And what are also some of the risks I think that we need to highlight? Well, I think the um, important thing to highlight here is our recent privacy announcement. Um, we think that Americans deserve better access to personalized and actionable information on which to make their healthcare decisions, but at the same time, they deserve uh, to, to know that that information is being held private and secure. And uh, as you noted, uh, technology is exploding. It's, it's evolving rapidly. We're generating actually exabytes of data in healthcare now. Um, that's a new, a new word we have to enter into our vernacular. Um, and we're also sharing it um, more commonly with our partners to develop solutions that can really help improve quality, make sure that care is more equitable and uh, improve costs, make it more affordable. Um, so it's, things are changing very dramatically. And at, at the same time, um, we've seen during the pandemic that the, there are bad actors out there. And those bad actors are also getting more sophisticated and determined, and we need to stay a step ahead. Um, the health insurance providers have always been at the forefront of protecting health uh, information for consumers. But with this release of uh, documents that are now up on our website, the industry is 
reaffirming its commitment, and it's also providing some concrete recommendations for how, how we do just that as a nation, that we can all stay ahead, ensure the information is private and uh, secure. So there are three documents. I'll really quickly tell you what's out there. The first is uh, from the board of directors. It's a set of core priorities. It's got five main themes. The first one of it is that uh, consumers should uh, have easy access to their information, but um, they also should uh, know how it's going to be used, right, and whether or not it's going to be shared. The second is that the information should be held private and secure no matter who holds that data. Right now, the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, only applies to plans and providers and some of their business partners. So any of the health information outside of those organizations is largely ungoverned right now. The third piece is that we think demographic data should be collected. Um, we're thinking you know, race, ethnicity, disability status, that sort of thing. But it should be used to, uh, to it should be leveraged to improve quality and ensure that we're reducing disparities in care. It obviously should not be used to discriminate whether intended or unintended. The fourth is that these sorts of technologies like apps and digital platforms that are currently outside of HIPAA, um, they really need to make sure that they're building in protections within those uh, particular technologies. And the last is that uh, we think the commercial sale of individual health information should be prohibited unless um, there is express agreement from the consumer. So that's the highlights there. I will just say um, the two other documents are the CMO leadership team came out with a detailed roadmap that we can't go through here, but um, suffice it to say, it does call on Congress to extend either HIPAA or some sort of similar law to those organizations that hold healthcare data that are currently outside of HIPAA. And it really makes the point that Consumers shouldn't have to make a choice between easy access to the information and it being held private and secure. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a general question for, for the group, uh, a topic that I know that we discuss often uh, in our different uh, meetings that we have internally, and it's really around innovative drugs. Um, and whether it's vaccines uh, for COVID, new biosimilars, or uh, treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Um, how do you think we should uh, balance evidence, affordability, and access, uh, knowing what we're seeing by way of the pricing for some of these new products? And I don't know who wants to take that one first, whether uh, Kate, you or Mark, uh, maybe can jump in on there. I'm happy to start. And I know that um, Mark and Danielle probably have a lot to add to this, but I would start by saying that, um, you know, the chief medical officers of the health insurance providers, you know, lead teams of experts who routinely review evidence on new drugs, new um, treatments, new devices, et cetera. So they really do um, constantly, you know, review new things that are coming out, innovative um, treatments and technologies. I think, you know, Matt, you mentioned the vaccines. I think that's a huge success story. We are all thankful that those vaccines um, for COVID were made available so quickly and, and um, you know, have been widespread. But I think, um, you know, the one, one example, and you mentioned the Alzheimer's um, treatment recently, I mean, that's an area where, um, you know, the evidence sort of shows that we don't have um, confidence in the safety of that treatment, nor the effectiveness of that treatment, um, Agile Helm. And, um, and that also is, you know, the affordability is a big challenge as well. So that's an example where, um, you know, the, the CMOs kind of looked at everything and uh, essentially would say, you know, we don't have a safe, effective treatment, um, and nor is it affordable for individuals or for the system. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I, I thought that was a great summary, Kate. Maybe the only uh, a couple points of emphasis to build on that, I think through the process of, and again, I think the Alzheimer's class of drugs is a perfect example. 
where, uh, as we were discussing um, uh, the proposed national coverage determination that CMS has put out for comment, repeatedly what we heard, the concerns that we heard from our uh, CMOs and others was focused on the adverse patient impacts. And I think it's uh, particularly when you've got health plans that have to be responsible for the entire you know, sort of uh, care for people, that they are uh, very person-centered uh, and focused on what the overall implications would be. And they repeatedly said that while the evidence was um, quite uh, minimal we said, on, the, on the actual benefit to the drug, the adverse impacts that were documented through the clinical trials were really quite large. So it, it really does, sh it's a sort of a microcosm of the sort of assessments that plans uh, uh, are always, always considering ways to ensure that treatments that work need to be covered and accessible for people. But where you've got sort of low value care, if you want to call it that, uh, that those are the, uh, the issues that can uh, cause you know, serious health issues for people and, and can uh, adversely impact the overall uh, affordability of the program. Just one other thing, just to take the, in, in terms of affordability, um, again, if there was a different clinical profile for these drugs, it'd be one thing. But given the clinical profile, recall that the um, actuaries at CMS, when they were setting Part B premiums uh, for um, the Medicare program for 2022, before they had a sense of what the coverage would be, um, basically estimated the largest increase in Part B premiums, I believe, in the program's history because of the contingent costs of this drug. So it's just, you know, these have flow through implications, not just for people with this so horrible disease, but for all Medicare beneficiaries. I might just add that, um, you know, the first generation of value-based payment models between plans and providers largely carved out drugs. Uh, but as we move to larger risk-based models, um, the hope and expectation is that, um, you know, outpatient drugs will be folded into those uh, programs. On the, the retail uh, side, you know, uh, there are uh, several policy hurdles that make it somewhat difficult to implement outcomes-based pricing and indication-based pricing uh, programs between plans and pharmaceutical manufacturers. And that's certainly something we've been advocating for our flexibilities to um, encourage and allow more of those programs. Great feedback on, uh, from all of you. Thank you for sharing those perspectives. Um, why don't we maybe turn to an audience question here and uh, I'll, I'll just kick things off. Uh, and the question is, as Congress races through the first half of the year and heads to the midterms, what are the top three healthcare issues you're watching? Um, great question. So uh, obviously uh, 2022, at least from a legislative perspective, has gotten off to you know, a little bit of a, a slower start, I think, than maybe we were expecting uh, with all of the efforts around uh, Build Back Better uh, through the uh, end of 2021. But uh, clearly some really important issues that we're paying attention to include what happens um, with the ACA ARPA subsidies that I noted earlier. There's a, a cliff that they expire um, at the end of uh, 2022. And, and if they're not extended, you know, when we get uh, to later in the year, um, we know that uh, uh, consumers are gonna see some significant premium increases if, if that is not addressed. And we think that that's a really um, important uh, priority. Um, I think another area that we're paying, uh, you know, very close attention to is um, whether or not there will be, you know, additional changes with respect to, you know, prescription drug prices, Medicare Part D uh, reform, you know, has been discussed uh, for a couple of years now, you know, actually dating back to uh, efforts, uh, you know, by senators, you know, Grassley and Wyden, um, you know, uh, in a previous Congress uh, where they were looking at some reforms, you know, plus we know that prescription drug prices are a top issue for Americans in every poll that you read. We know that prescription drug prices, you know, are, are among the top, if not the top, you know, healthcare issue that Americans uh, want to see 
addressed. Um, and then, you know, some other important issues that we're looking at, especially um, that Mark mentioned around the extension of uh, flexibilities with respect to telehealth um, and whether or not that will be included in potential, um, you know, packages, whether it's in omnibus or, or others. Um, uh, you know, we think it's really important that that extension occurs. Uh, we know how important telehealth has been um, to uh, so many millions of Americans um, really to provide access to care. And we want to make sure that uh, we're not going backwards. So we want to continue to go forward and uh, build on the progress and the innovation that we've seen that was been so rapid, um, you know, through the pandemic. And we want to see uh, that continue. Um, next question. Um, uh, how have the first two months of the No Surprises Act implementation been? Uh, what has the industry learned so far? What open questions are there still? And, uh, you know, let me just sort of reiterate first with the comments that I made earlier, which is we think that the approach that the administration has followed, at least in terms of implementing the No Surprises Act, um, you know, has been the right one by uh, really leaning in on the, um, the market-based uh, payment structure uh, through the um, in-network uh, medium benchmark, uh, rather than relying on independent dispute resolution and arbitration. I mean, we know we've seen, you know, experience from states like California is a great example, you know, that has uh, surprise bills legislation in effect um, that relies on a, a, a market-based uh, uh, benchmark payment uh, in, in California. It's 125% of Medicare. Um, that we saw market participation and network participation actually increase, um, contrary to many of the you know, charges that we've seen from um, others. Uh, and and what, what we're watching very closely now are the multiple lawsuits and um, I, I made the comment at a, a conference the other day that uh, certainly there's no shortage uh, of uh, issues where the hospitals are willing to sue um, at any opportunity they have. And this is uh, another example where uh, the lawsuits that have been filed, and there's six of them, um, you know, are trying to undermine really um, the protections we think that uh, are so important for consumers and not just uh, with respect to the protections, but then uh, with respect to, you know, affordability. Um, we know that the administration has said that, uh, well, one, they're defending certainly their regulation, but second, that they're going to be putting out another regulation by the May timetable uh, to implement those other pieces. So we're, we're I think, watching very carefully, um, you know, what happens both with the lawsuits, as I mentioned, we're an amicus party in multiple lawsuits, um, and we hope that the um, you know regulation uh, is implemented and continues to to go forward. But we're watching very closely with respect to um, you know some of the operational issues, depending upon how those uh, turn out. Um, next question uh, on to Medicare Advantage. So, Mark, I, I guess I'll direct this one at you. So, we've seen um, enrollment in MA continue to grow every year. What's your take on uh, why that? growth is continuing to happen. Sure. Um, so just a couple reminder data points to build on. You know, you had mentioned that we're close now to almost 29 million people in the program, which really is an incredible increase. Uh, enrollment basically doubled the last decade and has continued to rise in the first couple of years of this decade. Now, you know, Obviously, this is a function in part of the baby boomers retiring and the increase in the number of Medicare enrollees in general, but it is far more than that. The percentage of Medicare beneficiaries in MA is also going up dramatically. It's almost doubled since 2010. We're at roughly 45% of all Medicare beneficiaries are now in MA, which is really quite astonishing for those of us who have been working with the program for a number of years now. It's, and what's also really something and, and, and quite gratifying is that enrollees in MA are more racially and ethnically diverse, and they're also more satisfied with their coverage than those in the original Medicare program. So we've really reached uh, quite a point in the evolution of this program. So then to answer your question, why, 
you know, there's sort of a simple answer and a much more detailed answer. The simple answer is for many people, MA is simply a better value for them. It gives them more financial security at a more affordable price than what they can get from the original Medicare program. And there's uh, ongoing and, and expanding research that demonstrates there are positive clinical outcomes for people who enroll in MA compared to original Medicare. So people enroll in the program, they're satisfied with it, they talk to others, and that's really generating uh, the uh, incredible growth we've seen. Now, um, to drill down a little bit further on that, you know, many plans do not require any additional premium to enroll. And people who do enroll in those plans will get benefits at no additional cost to themselves that they can't get in the original Medicare program. So some of the most common examples would be getting your Part D drug coverage without having to pay any extra monthly premium or getting, as you had mentioned, the dental vision and hearing benefits, which are of tremendous value to, uh, to Medicare beneficiaries. And they receive that in an integrated package. There's one card, one place, and they get that with a cap on their annual out-of-pocket costs, which again is not available in the original Medicare program. So it gives them the sort of financial peace of mind because they know that in every, any given year, they're protected from extraordinarily high cost sharing. And the design of these plans is very familiar to people. They're likely quite similar to the employer coverage that they had before they retired. For example, they often have co-pays for physician visits rather than 20% um, you know, cost sharing like you see in original Medicare. And I mentioned this out-of-pocket limit, which is incredibly important. And plans have really been able to demonstrate that many of the services that they provide through their network providers, like managing chronic conditions, uh, integrating and coordinating care and providing more telehealth options. You know, the word gets out. People um, take advantage of these programs. They find them value, valuable. They stay with the program. The program continues to grow. It's also really important. I think there's been a lot of um, uh, emphasis on this publicly, that MA plans that begin to offer new types of benefits that address various social barriers to better health. Uh, wellness and uh, nutrition, you mentioned some of these earlier, transportation, in-home caregiver services. Um, and you've got um, you know, research that is showing that plans are really making some substantial progress in reducing disparities, at least in certain metrics, like getting annual flu vaccines, diabetic eye care and kidney exams. All of these are incredib incredibly important. And that's on top of the expanding research showing the quality of care uh, that um, uh, enrollees in Medicare Advantage programs have been getting. So I think it's really, for uh, beneficiaries, it's value, it's the services, it's the design that gives them more and, and allows them, and, and the last thing I'll mention is the choice. In most communities in the country, people can exercise choice to find the option that best meets their particular needs. And that's a very, very powerful thing for people in the country. Thanks, Mark. Um, so next question looks like probably uh, directed at you, Danielle. What's happening in the privacy area now uh, that has made AHIP uh, take this issue on? Um, and what's happening uh, when so much of this issue has been left up to the tech companies? Yeah, so, um, you know, like I was uh, talking about before, you know, part of it is, as you pointed out, right, technology is just changing so uh, dramatically, right? Um, we're using more of it and at the same time, you know, in putting more data out there, right, there's more of a risk. Um, uh, I think there, there is um, also a particular impetus that is from the regulatory front. Um, the new interoperability and patient access rules require health insurance providers to put out individually identifiable information to third-party apps uh, if a consumer asks us to. 
The way that works, though, is that when the consumer makes that request, it basically checks a box and that information in leaving the plan and going to a um, technology is no longer protected under HIPAA. So it really has shown a, a light on the fact that there is this hole in the national privacy framework that we think Congress really needs to act on. So again, health insurance providers are really uh, working towards and wanting to give greater access to our members um, to make sure that they, they have the information to make their choices. But at the same time, it shouldn't be a choice between that access and it being private and secure. Yeah, highlighting that that sort of chasm between the protections uh, under HIPAA versus uh, outside of HIPAA, it's, it, it's really important that people understand uh, the implications of that. So next question looks like Kate probably bring you into this one. So what are some of the essential actions uh, to address issues with respect to health equity this year? Where do you think our focus should be? Well, I mean, clearly the uh, pandemic brought um, longstanding inequities in access to um, health care and in outcomes um, you know, to the forefront. And those um, really affect communities of color and other vulnerable and underserved populations. Um, two of the big things that, you know, I, I would say our industry is working on with many others um, that I think are really important to make progress in the health equity um, area include developing standards for collecting um, information on patients and consumers demographics and also building consensus on how to incorporate health equity measures into value-based care. So the reason the data standards are so important is because without them, it's really difficult to understand what kinds of interventions or what kinds of programs are really going to help address those health inequities. So we really need to have, um, you know, the, the, the data on the patients and the consumers available so we can, you know, build on programs that are actually uh, improving on um, uh, reducing health equities, I should say, and also, you know, um, you know, stopping programs that are not having an impact. So that's a really important piece. It's also key to recognize that um, the collection of that data or for you know, individuals to provide that data really has to be voluntary because it, it is their personal information and they may or may not wanna share it. So it's important to have standards for how that information is collected. And the other um, point around um, you know, basically incorporating health equity measures into value-based programs, again, it helps to um, provide incentives to everyone to improve health equity or reduce, reduce health inequities, I should say. So these are areas where you know, the health insurance industry, the health insurance providers are really doing a great deal of work, um, again, with many other stakeholders to make progress in those two key areas. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, that, that data piece is so critically important. I don't think it's you know been widely known or recognized um, just how important it is for us to get those data standards you know right in order to uh, really make a difference on equity. And so I, I think we have probably have time for one more question. And Kate, you're very popular here today, so uh, uh, an important uh, issue: mental health. Right? We've all known what a big impact it's had on so many uh, individuals. Uh, both before the pandemic, but especially through the pandemic. Um, what are some of the things that you think we can do in the short term to improve uh, mental health care access? Yeah, this is a really challenging and such an important area um, to work to improve. And um, clearly, you know, we are in an era, in a time where the demand for behavioral health care is to some extent exceeding the supply, if you will. But really, I think there are three things we can um, work on in the near term to try to improve access to behavioral health care. 
One is continuing to leverage telehealth. We've talked a lot about telehealth, but over 60% of the telehealth visits now are for behavioral health um, conditions. So that's an area where it really does help to provide um, you know, more convenient access um, and to really um, actually give clinicians more visibility to some extent into an individual's um, environment, which may actually be helpful um, for their um, counseling or therapy or treatment that they're experiencing. Another benefit of telehealth in this arena is that it actually can help address um, stigma to some extent, which often um, may prevent people from seeking care for behavioral health care. So, um, you know, with telehealth, you can get access to counseling and other services um, without potentially leaving your home. So, I mean, it's helpful with stigma, stigma as well. Um, the second area I would highlight, um, you know, that is happening today and we can continue to build on, which is integrating behavioral health care with primary care. Primary care is where most people get their, um, you know, most of their care. And so if we can provide tools and resources and support to primary care providers to be able to screen for behavioral health issues and to know where to refer people if necessary, that can really also improve access. Um, and I wanna just highlight that last week, AHIP released an issue brief on that topic with um, many examples of what health insurance providers are doing to collaborate with providers and promote access to behavioral health care through the primary care uh, setting. And then third, um, I think another really important area um, in the behavioral health space is to uh, improve the ability to measure quality. So in behavioral health, um, you know, we sort of lag a bit to, um, compared to the rest of medical care in terms of the, um, you know, use of quality measures. Um, so some progress is happening in this area. I want to highlight the core quality measures collaborative with, with um, which AHIP started and uh, uh, runs in partnership with CMS. Um, so the core quality measures collaborative is working on um, measures in the behavioral health space. And there's also some promise with um, the concept of measurement based care, which basically um, you know, where uh, providers use standardized tools to assess and diagnose um, people with behavioral health conditions. And then finally, I mentioned stigma in the context of telehealth, but I do think that, you know, stigma remains a challenge in terms of, you know, people um, maybe being reluctant to seek care for behavioral health issues. So we have to continue to chip away at that. And in some ways, you know, maybe it's a bit of a silver lining with the pandemic that we're all um, much more commonly talking about the um, anxiety and stress and, um, you know, isolation that we've all experienced from this very disruptive time. Yeah, hopefully once and for all, we can put the stigma of mental health uh, behind us uh, with this. Well, I just wanted to thank uh, my AHIP colleagues for joining me here today. I also wanted to uh, thank you, all of the participants who joined us. Uh, we hope that you found it uh, valuable uh, and a good use of time. Um, again, thank you so much for joining our annual State of the Industry event. I uh, just want to uh, close with two uh, mentions. One, there'll be a survey uh, that's uh, going out. I uh, really appreciate your feedback about this. And second, um, AHIP's uh, National Health Policy Conference and Government Programs Conference is coming up in March. Um, it'll be virtual. Uh, it will be a great event uh, with so many wonderful speakers, great sessions. Um, hope that you all take the opportunity to register uh, for the conference. You can just go to ahip.org and find out more details. But thank you so much. I appreciate all your time uh, and participation today. Have a good rest of your day.